So good morning, everybody, or afternoon, depending on what part of the country you're in. Um, I'm Paul Glassman and my co-presenter, let's see, how does this work? I push notes that way because the thing is backwards. <laughs> it's on my screen, is Dr. Alan Budenz. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start sharing some slides here. So you can see that the uh, topic that we have for today is improving practice efficiency and safety using minimally invasive procedures and teledentistry. And we're happy to be able to talk to you about this today. It's something that both Dr. Bedenz and I have been involved in for uh, quite a long time. And we want to thank the Virtual Dental Care Company for sponsoring this webinar where we can go into depth in a couple of aspects of it and hopefully give you some ideas that you can incorporate into your practices and be able to uh, alter your practices and organize them in a way that will allow you to continue to survive and thrive in a fairly changed world uh, during COVID and even in the future after that. So let's go ahead and, uh, and launch into it. Um, just, I have a couple of just disclosures. These are some, a lot of consulting arrangements I have these days. As you saw in the previous slide, I'm uh, Associate Dean for Research and Community Engagement at a new dental school that's forming in Northern California, California North State University, but I also do consulting, including Virtual Dental Care, the sponsor of this webinar. Um, I'm gonna say just a very couple things, really just one data slide, which is this one about dental care in the United States. And um, the, uh, you know, this is data from the American Dental Association's Health Policy Institute showing that most people are not getting dental care in the United States. This is broken down by age groups and the highest utilizers of dental services here are children. But even for children, they are uh, only about 50% of children are having even what's represented here as an annual dental visit. And of course, an annual dental visit isn't much of a marker of someone having complete dental care. Um, so the, without providing any more data, just the conclusion from lots of data is that we have a dental care system in the United States that's currently serving primarily the wealthiest and healthiest people in the country. It's not exclusively, of course, there are plenty of people who are not wealthy and healthy getting dental care, but the people most likely to go into dental offices are those people who are the most affluent, who have the best, who are the best educated. They're also the people with the least amount of dental disease. And um, they're the people who probably need dental care less than the people who are not going into dental offices. So some people can consider that a problem. I think about it as a huge opportunity for the oral health industry to sort of rethink how we deliver services and how can we reach those that close to 60% of the population that's not getting dental care, certainly not on any kind of regular basis. And so if you think about these, next slide is the three tenets of where the oral industry is already heading and will continue to head in, in a way that will produce better outcomes for the dental industry and better health for the population it involves these three things. There's currently some work being done, I'll just mention quickly in a minute, on measurement and payment incentives. There are new delivery systems, which is really around teledentistry, which we're gonna spend a little bit of time on this webinar talking about. I know some of you are already involved in using teledentistry systems. Some of you have been using the teledentics product made by Virtual Dental Care, but maybe some of you are not. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about uh, how you can optimize the use of teledentistry to optimize your practice. And then finally, prevention and behavior science. And the point we're gonna try and make here is if you're using teledentistry and you're getting to people, if you're not using the very best prevention and behavior science, then you're also missing the opportunity to create the most health and do it at the lowest cost and make your practices as efficient and safe as possible. So in terms of me measurement and payment systems, just one slide, which is just to point out the fact that there are a lot of very big players in the dental industry who are working very hard on this idea of measurement and payment systems. That includes uh, the Dental Quality Alliance run by the American Dental Association payers, uh, both commercial and public payers, and then the Hearst Health Center system and even group practices. Uh, so that's gonna have an increasing impact on our practices is the ability to show that we're actually producing better health as opposed to just doing lots of things to people. But we'll spend a little bit more time on prevention and behavior science. So I'm not gonna say anything about it now other than to say this one slide that we're in an era now where there's a declining role for the dental drill. We have so many things we know how to do now that can actually manage and treat dental disease without needing a dental drill, which sometimes me means without needing a dental office or necessarily even a dentist on the front line where we can use allied personnel to really help us control disease. So many things that we didn't have certainly when I was in dental school. And Dr. Benz is gonna spend some time talking about the opportunities in 
minimally invasive dentistry and how we can realize that potential. Um, the other thing I'll just mention quickly is the changing understanding about behavior change principles. And I think we all realize that the thing that makes the most difference about whether people have good dental health or not has to do with, I call mouth healthy habits. Do people, mostly we're talking about brushing and eating habits. Do people do the things they need to do on a daily basis? That has much more impact on their oral health than anything we as dental professionals can do to them or for them. So we understand now that we're much more likely to help people or support people in adopting mouth healthy habits if we engage community members in delivering information. Um, again, having community members reinforce what we as dental professionals say, but particularly the last three bullets there, which is to be able to tell someone to adopt or suggest some small incremental change to be able to have ongoing reinforcement and coaching and peer support. We can't really do that in the context of a dental office because we don't see them often enough. And particularly, we don't see the people who need this kind of help the most. And so it's become very clear that it's going to be really important in the future for the dental office and dental industries to engage community organizations that are in a much better position to support behavior change. So enough of that. Let's talk now, move on to the idea of delivery systems and primarily around teledentistry. So teledentistry is gaining widespread understanding now. I'll talk in a few minutes ago when I first started doing it, which is close to 15, 16 years ago, it was really unheard of where people would say, well, you can't do that in dentistry. It has, it'll never have any impact on dentistry. We know that's not the case now. So we're seeing lots of companies beginning to form. Um, I think they're in, the, in these four categories I listed here. So one is that you have companies now that are doing what I call just advice or, or referral. Um, and they're primarily using maybe video conferences or maybe even something as simple as a patient sends in a photograph, you know, in, 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 in an email or a text message, and the dentist responds with a phone call or maybe a video conference and gives them some advice. Um, there are companies that have actually made a business out of that. So I call those call centers, and you can, they're, they advertise, they're available 24 hours a day. You can uh, pay some money, you get on a uh, call center, you get on a, a video conference with a the dentist, they talk to you about your problem, and typically those end up in a referral to a bricks and mortar dental office. There are some companies that are taking that a bit further and they're providing what I call limited on-site care, where you might have a team that goes on to a, into a community uh, site, like a school or a business or a, or a nursing home or a community center, and they uh, collect some records and do some preventive work and maybe have a dentist who reviews the records, but often it ends up in a, again, a referral to a bricks and mortar dental office. But what we're going to focus on today is what we're calling full service dental care systems where um, you're in touch with the patient through a telehealth system. Maybe you have a team on site. Uh, the team on site in the community might be collecting full set of records and the dentist is reviewing the records and making a diagnosis and treatment plan. But if the person needs to see a dentist for part of their work, they're going to see that dentist who did the diagnosis and treatment plan. So you have a full service system of care with some people uh, working in the community and some parts of the team working in the office. I'm gonna very quickly run through a system that incorporates that full service idea. We've been, we started doing this about 15 years ago, designed this idea called a virtual dental home. The idea being to create a full home or dental home for patients, but doing it in a way that we use the, we call it a geographically distributed telehealth connected team. In other words, different parts of the team in different places, but connected together through a telehealth system. So a way that we did that was that we would have Here's a dental hygienist uh, and an assistant with their portable equipment. They could be in one place one day, another place the next day. When they're on site, they could take a series of radiographs, uh, photographs, create a full set of images, actually create a full electronic dental record, the same dental record you'd have as if you're a fully electronic record system in your office with all, the, all those images, all the charting, all the health history, uh, consent forms, progress notes, everything is there in a fully electronic dental record system. And then, workflow being they're collecting these records on site. A dentist who's not with them in the field, but is in the office is actually doing a diagnosis and treatment plan, reviewing the records, making a decision about what needs to happen. And if they decide that the patient uh, needs to come into a dental office, then there would be some support for doing that. But if they decide that everything that can be done could be done in the community, then the dental hygienist and assistant, we call the community team, could do a whole lot of things. And including traditional prevention uh, procedures and collecting all the diagnostic records for the dentist to review. And also um, in California, being able to place interim therapeutic restorations, which 
uh, can be done with, for those of you familiar with that term, it's sometimes a scoop and fill glass onomer technique. Uh, no, no anesthetic, uh, no, no drilling. Um, that small hole in that tooth for this young lady who's in a low income school, typically what happens is nothing until she ends up with a toothache and all kinds of major problems are in the emergency room. Um, in about 15 minutes, that decay is sealed in place. And those restorations can last for many, many years, really as long as conventional restorations in, in, in the right circumstance. So if you're not familiar with that technique, um, uh, let me know. I'd be happy to give you some more information about it or even conduct other webinars. But the point of all that was in this big study we did across 13 different communities, we were able to show that you could actually make this idea of telehealth connected teams work with different people in different places, producing that full service system of care that I talked about. And some of the takeaways from that were, we could actually reach people who are not getting dental care in a traditional, <clears throat> traditional uh, office environment because of all the barriers they faced. And um, we could keep a lot of people healthy, including children where two thirds of them, we found did not need to make a trip to the dental office. The, the dentist was certainly involved using the telehealth system, but didn't actually need to be in person with the patient. And that was before we actually had silver diamine fluoride here in the United States. And we're estimating now it could be something like 75 or 80 percent of children in schools could be kept healthy. Now you think about that, it's really an astounding, astounding conclusion that you could keep the vast majority of low income children who typically are not getting any dental care, uh, keep them healthy at school using allied personnel as the, on the front line. And then some of those who need to have some work in a dental office, they're more likely to go into the office with the system because they're being told they're just going in for the one filling or the one extraction and maybe one appointment or a couple appointments rather than having to go repeatedly, which they just have so many barriers to be able to do that. So that was kind of the beginning of teledentistry starting to get recognized in our country. Now it's really all over the place. I have trouble keeping this uh, chart updated because I'm hearing about so many other states that are adding teledentistry as a component of what they do. And certainly the industry is blossoming. I did a quick Google search just searching for teledentistry and I just ran out of room on the slide to put all of the logos of all the companies I was finding that are doing teledentistry. So what's clear to me is that we're moving towards a system now where we're going to be thinking about instead of dental care being offered in dental offices or the dental office being the center of the dental universe, we're moving towards a system where we can start to think about what I'm referring to here as community engaged oral health systems, community engaged oral health systems. So the dental office really has a big role as that, as a place where the more complicated things can be done, where the dentist is that directs the care, but the opportunity to reach out beyond the dental office and engage populations of people in dental care that were not getting dental care before is just huge. And I know it makes some dentists nervous about feeling there'll be some competition as you reach out into community sites and if the dentist isn't doing everything. But the reality is when you start to get involved in these kind of systems, the net flow of patients is two dental offices. There are close to 200 million people in the United States not getting regular dental care. So there is plenty of work for everyone to do. It's just a huge opportunity. And again, uh, these are the golden rings of uh, getting us from where we are now to a system like that where we start to think about uh, getting some rewards for, for making the population healthier, uh, new delivery systems, primarily teledentistry, and then employing the new science and prevention and behavior systems. But of course, we have a little bit of a detour now with COVID-19. Um, so I want to spend just a minute or two talking about the impact of COVID-19 and then uh, finish up with some conclusions about the potential that we have even in the COVID era. So we know now from data from the American Dental Association, this is looking at their weekly or biweekly survey of dental practices in the bottom bar that 98% uh, of dental offices are open again. Uh, many of them closed initially, but they're almost all open again. The green uh, part of the bottom bar is fully open and the uh, yellow part is open, but business as usual. And you see there's only very few that are seeing emergencies only or, or closed. So most offices are open. And in fact, there's some uh, publications like this one from the uh, National Academy of Science that actually ranks dental offices as one of the most uh, important or essential components, even though there's recognizing some risk. So there's a lot of impetus to have dental offices be open again, but even in that environment where offices are opening and they're being that uh, opening is being supported as an essential service for the population, there's still a lot of dentists. This is a survey from DentaQuest showing 96% of practitioners believe that there's going to be long-term changes in dental practice based on COVID-19. And of course, those are things like uh, the need for pre-appointment screening and uh, 
and ask all the questions you need to ask on recent travel, recent exposure, and additional PPE, and all of the enhanced disinfection procedures that are needed to take place. So we're, we're obviously not going back to business the way it was prior to COVID. Uh, the Dental, American Dental Association has done a great job of coming out with lots of information about guidance uh, to return to work. Um, if you haven't seen this document, it's got a lot of useful things in it, including some good COVID screening uh, tools and other, other information. And the uh, CDC, of course, is constantly updating their guidelines. But one of the things I noticed both in the ADA and the CDC and other guidelines, uh, the CDC actually specifically refers to this NIOSH or National Institute for Occupational Health and Safety diagram, looking at how do you deal with hazards. And it wasn't that this was actually created before COVID, but it applies in the era of COVID, where they have this diagram called the hierarchy of controls. And what you see here is that the things at the bottom of the screen, uh, PPE, administrative cold engineering controls, are, are deemed the least effective things you can do. And at the top, the most effective are things like elimination or substitution of something else for what you normally be doing. What I'm finding in both the ADA and the CDC guidelines is very little attention based, based on elimination. Almost all the efforts in organized industry has been around the least effective things is getting enough PPE and engineering controls and airflow and things like that. Uh, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time now talking about the most effective things that can be done, which is elimination of hazards, at least substitution for them. And so we'll do that by this diagram, which is a diagram of a, sort of my crew drawing of the dental practice of the future. Well, of course the future is now, it has been with us now for a number of months. And so let me just walk you through this diagram. What we have here is a, uh, is a uh, this little, uh, uh, diagram of the building, that's the dental office. And you can see over here, we have the highly modified operatory. This is the operatory where you're gonna be doing aerosol producing procedures and complex procedures. And you really do have to pay a lot of attention now to the proper use of PPE and donning and doffing and changing much more frequently and disinfection and maybe even modified airflow in those operatories. That's all a part of the world we're living with and we'll be living with for, I predict, many years to come. But we also know that we don't have to be producing aerosols for everything we do. And again, Dr. Bedenz is going to get into that in more in just a minute or so. We can also begin to think about maybe some parts of the office don't need all of that uh, physical uh, remodeling and, uh, and controls where we produce more minimally invasive procedures. So maybe more minimally, invite, minimally modified parts of the office. But the important thing in this diagram is to look at the top part of this cloud. It's, as I say, it's not a dark cloud, it's a very bright cloud. This is the teledentistry cloud. So even if all your work is being done in the office and you're not paying any attention to connecting with people outside the office, having a robust full functioning teledentistry system, and I'll tell you what I mean by that in just a minute, will allow all kinds of connections for pre and post visit care, uh, advice, explanations, paperwork, uh, signing paperwork, um, a patient portal to upload things, a way that you can actually reduce the time that people spend in the office and increase efficiency and safety. So we're conducting a study now. We're doing it first phase is just opinion study where we're asking uh, a lot of dentists about their potential for eliminating visits to the office, taking care of people, not neglecting people, taking care of them through a teledentistry system where you could do uh, post-operative evaluations, problem-focused evaluations, treatment planning presentations. You know, it's much better actually to do a treatment planning presentation over a video conference where you don't have a mask on so people can actually see your face. Um, providing guided oral hygiene instructions, all kinds of things like that. Recall visits on very healthy patients who may not actually, the main reason for the recall is to talk to them. And we're getting estimates of 20 to 50% fewer in-office visits needed if you're employing that kind of system. We're also asking about, could you have shorter visits? A visit where prior to the, to the person coming into the office, you, you get in touch with them, you understand their concerns, you set the expectations for the visit, uh, update all the demographics and update their health history, explain the procedures, get consent, um, talk about the fact that you're gonna be using minimally invasive procedures and the value of all those. Again, estimates of 20 to 50% shorter visits and applying a system like that. So if you think about that, that stuff, what you realize is that we have a huge opportunity to have fewer in-office visits and certainly shorter visits where people come in, meaning less invasive procedures, less PPE, less credit appointment books, lower in-office costs, less infection risk, and certainly greater patient appreciation. So the idea is if you really embrace this and understand how you use a tele-dentistry system to modify your office, then that potentially gives you some experience to be able to think about how you actually reach out to the community. Um, both in, in rural areas, you might even think about having an office 
that has connections to dental hygienists who are working in a whole bunch of areas around the office through this teledentistry system and broaden the ability or even ability to have an office in a place that we wouldn't think would be able to, to support it. So using an optimized teledentistry system that has all these functions, like we're gonna tell you about in a few minutes, really gives us the opportunity to create workflows. I don't have time to go through that now, to be able to realize the potential for the declining role of the dental drill and to realize the potential for all of these new aspects of the new world of dental care. So at this point, I'm gonna stop sharing because we really wanna get into some detail now about prevention science and the new opportunities that that provides to you. I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Dr. Bedenz now to talk about prevention science and I'll be back with some concluding things to talk about about how you can actually find out more about this idea of an optimized teledentistry system towards the end. So Alan, over to you. All right, great, thank you, Paul. Let me just get my screen sharing here and let me just set one thing here with a pointer. Here we go, got my laser pointer. Uh, so again, I don't have any um, uh, financial interest in any of the products that I'm going to talk about here. Uh, in terms of caries disease management strategies, Paul has already alluded to a good bit of this. Certainly preventive dentistry in the first place can make our practice situation much safer. And chemical remineralization is very, very uh, possible these days. And again, minimizing the need to drill and generate any kind of aerosols. But what I wanna focus on today are first, silver diamine fluoride, SDF, and a little bit about more minimally invasive techniques, both non-surgical and surgical minimally invasive techniques. Um, and so looking at all these things uh, listed above this box here, none of these require any drilling and therefore you're not creating any aerosol. So both now in the COVID-19 environment, but also for efficiency in the future, these are ways, techniques that we can use to make our practice more efficient and make it safer, both for us and for our employees and for our patients coming into the office. So um, first off, looking at silver diamine fluoride, you know, silver's been around in medicine for centuries. Uh, the ancient Romans used silver in medicine and they used to use silver containers for storing water and same thing American settlers would throw silver coins into a barrel of water to maintain the freshness, the safety of the water. And silver instruments were used in surgery for decades, uh, centuries as well. So silver has been around for a long time here. Um, you know, the antimicrobial properties of silver, they weren't really known, they weren't understood, but they did work this way. They saw fewer infections resulting when they used silver instruments and so forth. Silver has a very broad antibacterial spectrum, low toxicity to the human body and less risk of cross um, uh, reactivity um, for bacteria, building up bacterial resistance. Now in dentistry per se, again, for thousand, over a thousand years, we've had silver available, different types of silver compounds. And in fact, G.V. Black, who many of you may recognize as kind of recognized as the father of modern operative dentistry, he published protocols for the use of, of silver nitrate back in 1907. But these were very, very caustic solutions. So uh, I had to be very, very careful with these things. In 1917, an, ammoni an ammoniated silver nitrate solution was developed. And this was used for many years up until the 1950s. This was fairly common in private practices used really as a, um, as a disinfectant for cavity preparations. So nowadays we have silver diamine fluoride and silver diamine fluoride is basically uh, a fairly high percentage of silver, the antimicrobial characteristics, and then uh, five to 6% of fluoride. And notice that the fluoride concentration is double what you have in fluoride varnish. So 44,800 parts per million. So very high fluoride content. And then it's got some ammonia in there, which is a stabilizer and also a pH neutralizer. And neutralizing pH is very important for controlling decay. So really, you know, SDF has been around for quite a while. It was originally developed in 1969. It's been commercially available since the early 1970s. 
but it didn't really get to the United States until 2014. And then it was brought in as a desensitizing solution and it's been used off label uh, as an anti-caries. Now it is approved for anti-caries and it's a very good. And this uh, Elevate product is just one of the SDF products that's available. Reva Star is another version of SDF that's available. The only thing different is that Reva Star has um, an iodine solution that can neutralize the darkening, the staining that SDF uh, creates. But using SDF for caries control is what I want to focus on today. It is used for hypersensitivity, as I mentioned, and also used for disinfecting of root canals or cavity preparations as well. Advantages, again, the very strong antimicrobial characteristics there over a very broad spectrum. Uh, it delivers fluoride that can help with remineralization of any lesion. And it's very simple to use. It's very inexpensive. Um, it's about 50, 50 cents for treating five teeth. Uh, and it's very non-invasive. Now disadvantages, it stains any caries lesion black. It does not stain sound healthy enamel or sound healthy dentin, but it stains any demineralized carious tissue. Um, if it gets on the gingiva, it can cause irritation. So we want to carefully protect the gingiva with some Vaseline or, or rubber dam or something. Um, it can have a little bit of an aftertaste briefly. And if you get it on your skin, it'll stain the skin for about a week. And you don't want to get it on any clothing or counters, anything like that, because it will stain them permanently. And here we can see some teeth that have been treated with SDF. Now, the teeth don't turn black immediately. This occurs over about a week's time. And uh, you know this is really a very fast, efficient, very safe way to manage rampant caries. If it's a single restoration, well, maybe I can do this in, in the one appointment in the dental office. But if we're looking at a whole mouthful of lesions, um, this is a quick way to stop the caries process and then uh, with multiple appointments as needed, you can treat all these things. So when would I use SDF? Well, first off, patients with extreme, extreme caries risk, meaning that they have active caries lesions and they also have xerostomia. So I know they're highly prone to get more caries disease. Patients with behavioral or medical management challenges, special needs patients where cooperation is very difficult, Patients with multiple lesions that you can't treat in one appointment, but I want to stop the development of caries right now. I want to prevent it from getting any worse over the time that it will take me to treat these multiple lesions. It can be used for very difficult to treat lesions, recalcitrant lesions, and patients with limited or no access to care. This is really where SDF has, has gained its initial advantage used in a lot of global outreach uh, programs where we do outreach to very remote parts of the world to deliver dental care to people where there's no dental offices existing. So how often should you apply it? Well, multiple applications is really the ideal. And what we, what we feel is that three applications a week apart is really the best. However, you know, twice a year is good. Once a year is better than nothing. Uh, so it depends on what the availability is of the patient coming to the office. But um, certainly the, the ideal is, is three applications one week apart. This will give you the best caries control success. Um, you only need to apply it to the caries lesions. You don't necessarily have to remove any of the decay whatsoever. Just go ahead and put the SDF on there. And you know, the ideal treatment is for two years, but again, uh, if the patient is only going to come in once, one time application is better than no time application. You will get some uh, caries uh, arrest at least for a few months, maybe for the year. Um, so it's, it's at least a step in the right direction. My particular approach uh, for patients that have high to extreme caries risk, and particularly with multiple caries lesions, where it's gonna take me multiple appointments to treat all these lesions, what I like to do is first off, apply the SDF immediately. And again, if I can, I'll do um, three separate applications one week apart. That's if the patient can come in 
at, at three weekly appointments. That's not always possible. Um, I'm not going to restore any teeth for two to four weeks, and I'll explain why here in just a moment, why I'm going to have that uh, up to a month wait time after the last application of SDF. When I have them back after this one month period, two, two week to four week period, then I want to remove as much stain to structure as I can without endangering the pulp vitality of the tooth. And then I'll go ahead and place glass ionomer over the dentin, and then I can place whatever aesthetic restoration I want, conventional resin restoration, or a um, maybe a resin modified glass ionomer, or just a plain glass ionomer restoration over the whole thing. The reason that I'm waiting this two to four weeks after the last application of SDF is to minimize staining of the final restoration. Okay, now a good question right here is, does this affect bonding of resins or glass ionomer to the tooth? And the answer is no, it does not affect, it does not weaken the bond whatsoever. But if we place SDF and then put a resin over the SDF immediately, when we light cure that resin, it pulls silver up into the resin, we get discoloration of the resin. So we've got a darkened filling, which if it's in an anterior tooth, it's not gonna look good. With glass ionomer, uh, whether it's a, a resin modified or a traditional glass ionomer, it will darken over time. If we use a, a, a light cure on a resin modified, it will darken, but not as much as a true resin would but it will darken over the first week. Uh, glass ionomer, I really like because of the fluoride release there. We can use this for cementing crowns as well. Uh, but again, you know, we want to uh, remove any SDF stained superficial dentin before we take our impression there. So for best aesthetics, we want to get rid of stained tooth structure as much as possible. This is so we minimize any darkening showing through the final restoration or being pulled up into it. Now, if I have a situation where I need to do immediate restoration of the tooth, my goal then is to do it in as aesthetic a restoration as possible. So I wanna remove as much of the soft decay as I can and then place a glass ionomer, conventional glass ionomer liner. And then I'll put my finished restoration into the tooth. I don't want to use SDF in this situation because if I put a resin over it, it will darken the restoration and it won't look good. So I don't want to use SDF in that situation. I can use SDF for a posterior restoration if aesthetics aren't important. So I can use it as a preparation disinfectant before I put in my glass ionomer and or resin. But if aesthetics are what I want, I know I've said this before, if aesthetics are important, I don't want to use SDF for an immediate restoration because it will cause discoloration of the restoration. All right, let's shift gears just slightly here. Let's look at some non-surgical, minimally invasive techniques. So sealants, resin infiltration, and the atraumatic, or also called the interim therapeutic restorations. So for sealants, um, resin versus glass ionomer sealants. And so I have to ask you the question, what is the purpose of a sealant? Is it simply to create a long lasting restoration over the pits and, and fissures of the tooth? Or is it to prevent decay from occurring within those pits and fissures of the tooth? Okay, as far as resin sealants are concerned, we know they do have greater wear resistance. Resin is a much stronger restorative material. And when done properly, resins are very retentive to enamel to structure. However, I have to stress that's if they are placed properly using a rubber dam or some other very good isolation technique. Because if, if um, a resin sealant is not properly sealed to the tooth, it leaks. And all of us who have been practicing dentistry for more than a handful of days, we've seen plenty of failed sealants, resin sealants on teeth, and we've seen the decay that can occur underneath these sealants. So, you know, to me, the purpose of a sealant is not really as a restoration. It's all about prevention of decay occurring within these deep pits and fissures. 
So to me, glass ionomer is a much better sealant material than a resin sealant. And here's my list of reasons. Number one, it's much better retention with difficult isolation. Glass ionomers do not have to have a completely dry environment. They like to have a little bit of moisture. So I don't have to use a rubber dam or uh, you know, extensive isolation. Uh, they have better retention on partially erupted teeth. They have better retention on immature enamel. And when do we most frequently place sealants? It's on young children with newly erupted posterior teeth with deep pits and fissures. Well, hey, it takes two to three years for the enamel to mature. And immature enamel, resin will not bond to very well, even with good isolation. So we already have a compromised bond to these newly erupted teeth with a resin sealant. Also for older patients with root caries, we get better bonding of glass ionomer to these sclerotic enamel and dentin root surfaces. And of course, as you know, glass ionomers do help with remineralization of the tooth. And in fact, they produce fluorapatite, replacing the hydroxyapatite of the original tooth structure, which is more decay resistant. So glass ionomers to me are a great sealant material, especially for high caries risk patients, but frankly for all sealant applications. They do release fluoride, they recharge with fluoride from the saliva, and the bond is stronger. Glass ionomer is a chemical bond to tooth structure. Dentin, enamel, immature enamel, demineralized enamel, sclerotic enamel, it is a chemical bond to all these. Resin is only a mechanical bond and only to healthy non-demineralized enamel. So to me, resin has limited application. So I think resins are fine in older children and adults if you can get good isolation. But for all the other situations, I think a glass ionomer sealant is a much better option. Now, I know some people go, well, yeah, but glass ionomers are going to wear down with occlusal forces and so forth. You know what? When you place a glass ionomer, you mush it into the pits and fissures of the tooth with your fingertip. Um, if it's down into the grooves, I don't care what wears off the superficial surface. That's not going to matter. But actually, even if the entire glass ionomer sealant were lost, the glass ionomer does exchange ions with the tooth structure and it leaves that tooth structure with a greater caries resist resistance and that's permanent. So to me glass ionomers have many many benefits and in terms of durability you know here we see on the left this is an eight-year-old glass ionomer sealant on the right a 12-year-old glass ionomer sealant on these occlusal surfaces. When done properly and technique is important with glass ionomers, uh, whether you're using it as a filling or as a sealant. And the most important thing about technique with glass ionomers is that you never want to let it get dry when you're initially placing it and until it's really fully cured. You never want to let a glass ionomer dry out because then it will become weak and fracture and all that. But done properly, these are very, very durable. These are beautiful looking sealants and they're they're very old. So are they temporary restorations or are they permanent restorations? Well, you know, you take your pick what definition you want to use. Uh, conventional glass ionomers have the best fluoride release uh, exchange with saliva. Resin modified glass ionomers have about 80% of the fluoride release of a conventional glass ionomer, but they have the advantage of uh, having better aesthetics than the uh, pure glass ionomers. They're not quite as opaque. So, uh, you know, I think either one is good, just depending on your personal preference there. All right, just real quick, uh, resin infiltration. This can be used for incipient caries lesions, meaning there's a little bit of demineralization occurring there. And these may appear as white spot lesions or for hypocalcified uh, enamel lesions. And essentially what they're doing is they're just sealing up the enamel porosities on the uh, surface that can be accentuated by the normal demineralization and remineralization process that our teeth go through multiple times every day. So it's really uh, these resin infiltrations are kind of bridging the gap between applying a chemical for remineralization and placing a true filling. It's kind of an intermediary uh, treatment between these two. It stops caries progression and it can give us a better aesthetic result. 
So here we can see in this picture, we see some uh, hypomineralization on these anterior teeth and with usually no drilling, but sometimes just a little bit of superficial drilling. So maybe a minor aerosol creation, but ideally no aerosol creation, we can get a much better aesthetic result as seen in the lower picture here. Can be done at any age, they're very non-invasive. Um, the only real disadvantage I see here is that if the patient goes to another dentist, if we do this on an interproximal lesion, if the patient goes to another dentist, the patient may take an x-ray and look at it and go, oh, you have a cavity on the mesial of this tooth. And unless the patient's aware or unless the new dentist has seen our treatment record, they may not recognize it's already been a treated lesion. It's been stopped, it's been controlled, and they may choose to be more aggressive than we were, and they may choose to drill that. And of course, when they go, oh, you've got a cavity here and a cavity there, uh, it can make the patient think, oh, well, my prior dentist wasn't doing their job because they left all these caries in my mouth. Uh, you know, I, I think that's unfortunate there. All right, looking at atraumatic restorative technique here, this is where we're using manual excavation to remove dental caries. So we're not using any anesthesia, we're not using a drill, we're not creating any aerosol whatsoever. And generally we restore these teeth with a glass ionomer, conventional or resin reinforced there because of the greater uh, bonding capability and because of the fluoride release that it has for stopping decay and for stimulating remineralization. So this technique is endorsed by the World Health Organization for preventing and restoring caries lesions. Now this has traditionally been for um, people with little to no access to traditional dental care, but you know what? We're realizing that this can be used in our traditional dental practices as well. Again, this was considered definitive restoration if there was no opportunity for follow-up care, but placed properly, these restorations can be a definitive restoration in the true sense of the word. Now, in the United States, we usually call these interim therapeutic restorations. Uh, this was a term generated by the pediatric dentist because they're working with baby teeth, with primary teeth, which they are essentially temporary teeth anyway. Uh, but this can be used in adult teeth and they can be definitive restorations. Um, and certainly coming back to some of what Paul was talking about and the cost of dental care, you know, for many people, the cost of dental care, uh, they, they avoid treatment because they're afraid of the cost or they can't afford the cost. They don't have any dental health coverage. So, you know, these techniques, even in our conventional dental practices, can give us another alternative to provide good quality care to patients at a reduced cost to the patient. And you know, with little or no aerosol generation, we can provide very good quality care. Now, here's an example of an art technique here. Um, it, I'll be honest with you, a little bit of drilling was done with a low speed on this preparation, but essentially what we're looking at here is we're looking at the uh, caries lesion a drill was used just to clean the margins here. You need to have clean enamel margins and ideally a little bit below the DEJ. So that's what was done here at the bottom picture. You can see we've got at least two millimeters of clean enamel and a little bit into the dentin surface there. We don't have to remove all the decay in the floor of this uh, preparation. And whatever decay needs to be removed can be removed with a, with a spoon. And lots of times you can do the whole preparation with a spoon, just scraping the enamel surfaces to get rid of the demineralized uh, tooth structure. But remember, glass armor will bond to demineralized enamel, so we don't have to get it perfect. So we can do these restorations without having uh, complete caries removal and without having to use a drill whatsoever. Now, um, complete caries removal. This is controversial. I know a lot of us, you know, we were trained back in the era of uh, using, uh, using amalgams and you had to remove all the decay because we knew amalgams would leak. So you had to get all the decay out. But if you are truly sealing the tooth, you have stopped the decay process. You have really 
placed a very good restoration there. And this has been shown in multiple studies that you don't have to remove all the, decay, all the decay, particularly if it's going to put you at risk of getting into the pulp of the tissue. So, you know, having said you don't have to remove all the decay, I will be honest, I always remove as much decay as I can as long as I'm not in, endangering an asymptomatic vital pulp tissue. Okay, so those are non-surgical minimally invasive techniques. All of these very fast, very efficient, very safe ways to manage caries disease with no drilling. So that means no anesthesia and no generation of any aerosol whatsoever. Now surgically, you know, how much do we need to drill? Again, let's think minimally. And what can I fill with? And again, I want to think about biomimetic materials. So here we see an x-ray and I don't see any occlusal caries on this tooth number 15. But when we look at the tooth, we go, okay, a little bit of stain, little demineralization in the mesial pit. Looks like there's probably some caries in that central pit. A little bit of stain, maybe caries, not sure in that distal uh, pit and into the lingual groove. So we've got options. We could just seal all these. If we seal them, we have stopped the decay process. We could use a fissure burr to open them up a little bit, okay, and then put a sealant or we might wanna do a real conservative, more traditional type of uh, prep there. So here's, here's the prep that was done in this particular case. And one thing I wanna point out here is that I would like to not go over the ridges. I'd like to maintain the integrity of that tooth as much as possible. And here's the final restoration done with, with resin over a glass ionomer liner. It's a beautiful restoration. This is a very nicely done restoration on the tooth. But again, think about our options here. You know, a sealant, very easy to do anywhere. Uh, if we use a glass on a sealant, it can be done in a school, in a nursing home, uh, in a non-traditional clinical setting, like Paul mentioned. Or if we use a little bit of, uh, of a drill with a Fisher Burr, again, we're minimizing the production of aerosol. Or if we're keeping our preparation down to a minimum, I personally would not have extended this out to the buckle. I would not have prepped this mesial pit. I would not have uh, probably prepped any of this, certainly not all the way down here in this lingual pit. I think we could have kept everything on the occlusal surface and restored the whole thing with glass ionomer or with glass ionomer as a base to a resin restoration. So here we see a little lesion. This is a primary tooth here. Here's what a, uh, a sealant ideally would do or, or, or a, an amalgam preparation, if you will. Uh, here we could use a composite, but if you're gonna place a composite, let's seal the whole occlusal surface, the whole pit and surface thing. So again, thinking about our options of what we wanna do. Now, if we have a two surface, a three surface restoration, yes, resins are gonna be stronger. They have a greater likelihood of, of better longevity, but still glass armor is something you might wanna can think think about, and certainly we can think about combining techniques. Now, just real quickly before I end here, remember about shrinkage. We know that conventional resins shrink about 2%. And here you see on a scanning uh, EM, we see the gap that's created here. So again, with a, with a resin sealant or a resin filling, you gotta be concerned about leakage. Whereas with glass armor, whether it's conventional or resin modified, there's very little to no shrinkage whatsoever. So we have a much better seal on the tooth. And we're also seeing new bioactive materials coming into play in the dental field, which have less shrinkage as well. So we might want to combine techniques here. Here we've opened up the tooth and this was done with a low speed burr. So a little bit of aerosol generation, uh, placed a glass ionomer liner and then a base could have just used one glass ionomer rather than two. And then a resin restoration over that and just a glass ionomer into the uh, distal pit here. So a combination of these materials is certainly an option as well. So my last slide here, carries disease management treatment planning. So, you know, we want to try to be as prevention oriented as possible, but ultimately uh, when we do have to do restorations, we want to think minimally invasive to minimize the tooth structure that we're destroying and to minimize the amount of aerosol that we're creating. 
particularly important in our COVID-19 era and, you know, for any future pandemics that may occur, but also just important for overall safety and conservatism of managing our patients' health care. So uh, that's it for me. I'll turn this back over to Paul. I think he wants to make some more comments. Uh, yes, thank you, Alan. So I um, appreciate that. And that was great uh, sort of overview about the whole potential for using minimally invasive procedures, reducing aerosols, again, increasing, increased efficiency and safety. So we'll spend, we'll just wind up in a couple minutes and then we'll have some time for some uh, questions and answers. Again, the uh, uh, question box is open. I've already got one question there, which we'll get back to in a minute. So adoption. So you like all these ideas. You're already using teledentistry to some degree, or you think it's an interesting thing. You like the idea of minimally invasive dentistry. How do you get going with, with all of this? Um, so we are actually uh, fortunate that the uh, virtual dental care company has offered to partner with us in a university study where we actually want to look at the ability for practices to take the theoretical questions I asked you, I showed you earlier about, can you actually keep some patients healthy at a distance when you're not actually physically uh, in contact with them? Um, and can you um, actually uh, have other patients come in for shorter visits? And so we're going to actually start a study on that. Um, there's going to be, there's a, this is a URL at the top of the uh, slide here. Don't worry about writing it down. You'll get a follow-up email so you get, uh, know how to access this web page where there's a little bit more information about this study. You actually watch a short video. You can understand some of the advantages of the platform that we're going to be using for this study, including the ability to get onto both synchronous and asynchronous interactions with patients, the ability to have a complete patient record of everything that happened with the patient during your outreach teledentistry interactions, the ability to uh, book appointments, either the patient can book them themselves when you set up your own schedule when you're available for teledentistry interactions, or you can book them to the office, the ability to make customizable forms. So all the forms you would normally have someone walk into your office and they're standing there uh, at the front desk filling out forms, all that stuff can be done outside of the office. Again, increasing efficiency and safety, the ability to have referral management. So you can have a network of other dentists you might be working with, specialists or other people that you can actually share records with, uh, again, following all the HIPAA guidelines, but that's all built into the system. So the point about all that is, what we're hoping to demonstrate in this demonstration is that once you get the idea about how to use teledentistry and you have an optimal system, that you can actually take advantage of all of this opportunities to have a more efficient practice, to minimize the amount of traffic in the office, to take care of a lot of people's needs and paperwork and all that kind of stuff outside the office, signing forms. And then uh, as you get your feet wet with all that, to even think about engaging the community. Um, so if you're interested, you'll get some more information. You'll be able to get on the website and potentially find out some more things or join the demonstration. And um, you know, our, our feeling is that this is the path and it will be increasingly recognized as the way that the dental industry is gonna go to be, stop the idea of dental care happens in dental offices. That's sort of the predominant idea in both the dental industry and in the lay public as well, and realize that dental care can be distributed. It can be actually very beneficial and lots of potential for helping both dentists, the dental industry, and the population to have better dental health. And again, there's lots of work to be done if we can engage the population and Maureen doesn't get into dental offices. So with that, we'll stop. Um, the presentation and uh, go back to now some um, answering some questions. So there is a, a Q&A box that's, uh, that's there in the, uh, in the control panel for, for Zoom. You can um, type in some, any questions that you have. And uh, so I, I, I'll just start with the first one that's here. Uh, I, the first question is, can you actually build insurance companies for services provided most, most remotely via teledentistry? And the answer is, um, Yes, uh, slightly qualified, and I'll tell you the slight qualification. It depends what state you're in. So I know we may have a national audience for this um, uh, webinar, and it depends what state you're in, and it depends on who the payer is. So the American Dental Association, I quickly put up a slide a while ago, a while ago about their guidance for uh, opening up dental practices, and they have a parallel guidance for billing uh, in the COVID era, and it includes their restrictions and the payment options from I think they probably have 30 or 40 different commercial benefit programs. Um, also, there's information available for your local Medicaid program if you're participating in Medicaid. In most states, not 100%, but in most states now, the answer is yes, that both commercial payers and uh, Medicaid payers are paying for dental procedures that are done through teledentistry in the same 
kind of um, system that I just showed you. Um, a follow quick follow-up question of that is what about billing for teledentistry itself? Most of the payers are not actually paying for teledentistry. I think the way to think about it is you think about teledentistry as a communication tool. So it allows the dental provider to provide the normally covered services, but without being in person with the patient. So you aren't necessarily paying for the communication tool, but you do have the ability, again, in most places with most payers, to provide the service and be paid for that service, whether it's done in person or using a teledentistry, a teledentistry system. Um, so I, I would recommend if you're a little unsure about the particular uh, payers or commercial entities, get onto the American Dental Association's website, look at their, uh, at their guidance there. Um, there are certainly almost every state now in the era of COVID has, and almost every payer has at least allowed payment for a problem, the D0140, which is a problem focused oral evaluation. Um, some have opened it up much further than that. And you can do a lot of things uh, in California. Uh, you can actually bill for a complete examination done during a, a teledentistry visit. Um, that may raise some eyebrows. So I think that, uh, um, by the way, in, in the chat is the uh, link to the uh, website for the Teledentix project if you want to find out more information about it. But um, it actually is the case that in, uh, in California now and increasingly in other states that the ability for a dentist to, to perform a complete examination over a teledentistry system is being recognized. Um, and we'll see how many more questions come in. I'd be happy to get into a little bit more depth about that as well if we need to. But let me just encourage you, those are the only two questions I saw come in so far. If people have other questions, um, please go ahead and enter them into the Q&A box. Um, do you then see teledentistry as more of a community outreach versus triaging dentistry? Um, we see the potential for teledentistry in many areas. So one of them is community outreach. Certainly its ability to provide, to, to create a dental office without walls where your dental practice is able to serve some people within the walls of the dental office and some people in a community setting that you don't have to have that distinction that your practice is confined by four physical walls. So it opens up that. Um, it's much more than triaging. The idea that some people think about is when you go to the community, what you're doing is getting people into the office. That, that's the purpose of the community is to get people into an office. But in our philosophy and the, and, and the options that are open now, you can provide complete treatment for many people in a community setting with part of your team being there. And you don't have to have everybody come into the office. Again, all the advantages of increased safety and efficiency by, uh, by doing that. Um, but even if you aren't thinking about the community at all, you're, you're never going to have any kind of community connection. I hope the point came across that we we're making is you could have a much more efficient and safe practice by using teledentistry to, to maybe provide care for some people without them setting foot in the office and for other people to actually do things both uh, pre and post visit, the things that can be done through teledentistry and also the way to shorten office visits and create less aerosols using, uh, using minimally invasive dentistry. Alan, do you want to add anything uh, about that sort of the advantages of teledentistry way, way beyond just triaging? Yeah, just that, um, you know, a lot of these techniques, and I know I, I threw that at you very quickly, but um, using glass onomer as a sealant or as a restorative material, these can be done very readily in these non-traditional office settings, you know, whether it be at a school for children uh, or be in a nursing home, anything like that. So a lot of dentistry can be done in these remote sites. It's still supervised by the dentist, but it can be done by auxiliary personnel. And you're still billing for these services. So it's a way really of expanding your office and your ability to provide access to more patients um, through this whole teledentistry um, methodology. But the other thing I think was critical that you said a while back, Alan, is even if you aren't in the community, even if you're only continuing to just work your, your dental practice in your office, the ability to switch from doing some procedures that you would have previously done that created aerosols to do that, to treat that same tooth or that same lesion or the same problem in a way that doesn't produce aerosols. You know, we, we have a payment system that really rewards procedures that produce aerosols. The more complicated the procedure is, the more profit. That's just the way it is in, in dental practice. But when you start to add in the cost of PPE 
and the risk and all of the disinfection things, it really does chip that equation. So if you had a choice between now doing a conventional, like that the teeth you were showing out between a conventional one surface restoration, or if that uh, caries was minimal enough that you could actually just seal it in place with either a, a, uh, an interim therapeutic restoration or even a, a glass on them or sealant, it seems to me that the payment question is tipping much more towards let's payment and safety questions much more towards let's do the minimally invasive procedure. I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Um, and so, yes, we'd, we'd be billing for uh, more preventive services and less invasive type of restorative procedures. But the other thing is that we can do a lot more of these very quickly in a dental appointment uh, or in the time that we have available. Um, so I, I think in a way they kind of make up uh, the one inefficiency makes up for the uh, invasiveness and the higher reimbursement for a traditional filling. And I think even just the public relations aspect of it to be able to advertise to your patients that you've really concerned about their about their safety, you're going to you know, be using the new minimally invasive procedures, which are actually better for teeth in, in some ways. Uh, you're going to produce less aerosols. They're going to spend less time in the appointment. appointment. You're going to use the teledentistry system to gather information before and after that they don't have to be in the office doing it. I think a lot of patients are really going to like hearing about an office that's going in that direction. Yeah, and plus we're also saying, you know, we're being more conservative of their natural healthy tooth uh, structure, which is, I think, a good thing. Um, I see a question here about, uh, do we need to provide an instruction sheet or sign off document for SDF treatment? Um, it's very important that the patient or the parents of a child um, are informed of the potential darkening of the teeth. Uh, you don't want to surprise them with their kid's tooth turning dark after a week and they go, oh my gosh, you know. So yes, very careful instruction is important whether you want to do that with written instructions or verbal instructions, that's kind of up to you, but you need to make sure that um, the, the individuals are properly informed of what to expect. And I know some entities, some practices do actually have a, a consent form for SDF where it actually has some pictures of the teeth and they, they can see exactly what it's going to look like. Yeah. Um, and Alan, do you think that there's a way that we could make that available to the participants? Some One of those uh, kind of, uh, um, consent forms that has, that has the photographs? Uh, yes, um, I, I will make sure that happens, yes. Yeah, we'll follow up with that and whoever asked the question, we'll make it available to everyone who signed up for the webinar so you can get one of those, a sample, sample of a consent form that has the pictures of teeth on it. Yeah. Um, let's see, I don't see any other questions in the, in the question box. We'll just see if anything else comes in the next couple seconds. Um, but if not, uh, we will, Thank you all for your participation. We hope that this, we presented some things that uh, open your eyes or suggest some possibilities for your practices to be able to think about ways that you can actually practice more safely and more efficiently. Um, gain your patients thanks for your attention to these kind of things. Actually be able to, if you really uh, start to get involved in this and take it to another level of reaching the community, uh, grow your practice, be able to engage the, as I say, 200 million people who are not getting dental care in our country who need dental services. And so there's, I think there's just tons of potential for individual practices and for the industry to benefit by rethinking the way that we do dental care. So I hope that resonates with some of you. And we would love to be able to have you as a part of this demonstration project so we can get some uh, follow with you and see how you actually end up using a system like this and, and the difference it makes. And we want to use that to help leverage the information to other practices to help them understand how this can really make a difference for their practices as well. So with that, let's see, was there another question that came in? No, no, just said that. Thank you. That would help. Okay. So that was it for questions. So again, I think uh, we're a little over time, so we'll sign off now and thanks everybody for your participation and good luck and stay safe. Thank you. All right. So long everybody.